Unit 5, Urban Livestock. So what's livestock? Well, a good definition of livestock is animals kept for food, materials, work, or profit, not as pets. And we'll look at each of these reasons for keeping livestock. First is food. Animals may be kept to supply food directly by consumption of the animals as meat. Animals may also be kept because they produce something we use as food without consuming the animals themselves, such as eggs or honey. And finally, some animals provide both, as fowls give us eggs and meat, while cows and goats give us meat and milk. So food can be a direct consumption of the animal or a product of the animal. Materials. We may keep animals for the valuable materials they provide, either renewable or not. What do we mean? Well, wool from sheep, goats, llamas, or other animals like alpacas is a renewable resource. They can provide a new batch each year. Some materials, however, such as leather or bone meal, are non-renewable as the animals are killed to obtain them. Of course, other parts of the animal may then be used for meat, so some of these animals, so some of these materials are a byproduct of the main purpose of raising the animals, which is typically meat. Work. Well, while it's not common in a developed world these days, animals have often been kept for the work they can do. Animals such as horses, mules, donkeys, oxen can pull plows and wagons as well as carry heavy loads directly. Animals such as dogs can be used to herd and control animals such as cows and sheep. And cormorants, a type of bird, are used to catch fish in parts of Asia. And worms are often kept for their ability to compost food waste and turn it into a valuable source of nutrition for plants, as well as being a saleable product themselves. And profit. Animals may be kept to be sold to others for any of the uses that we previously talked about as a means of making money. There are breeders, for instance, who specialize in supplying fowl, calves, piglets, etc., to people who will raise them and either use them or will in turn raise them and sell them in hopes of making a profit themselves. Let's take a quick look at laws and regulations. Unfortunately, there's a huge patchwork of various regulations around the U.S. regarding keeping livestock within city limits. Though now the trend is to allow certain types of livestock within city limits. Chicago, for instance, allows honeybees, chickens, and even goats to be kept within the city limits. Actually, there are no specific regulations on goats, except that they can't be slaughtered at home. So they're not specifically allowed, but they're not specifically disallowed either. Um, but despite this trend, there are many urban areas that still prohibit keeping animals that are traditionally thought of as livestock, poultry, goats, sheep, cows, while allowing very large dogs, captive birds, and other animals, including exotics. So the, the laws and regulations are not quite consistent from area to area. So what livestock is suitable for urban areas? What are the characteristics that such livestock would have? Well, of course, it depends greatly on the specific area and the regulations, and also how much space is available for the livestock and the type of space that's available. Given all that, though, some desirable characteristics would include relatively small size, so keeping the animals in smaller areas is a practical undertaking. Uh, low noise. Many cities that allow chickens do not allow roosters, specifically because of the noise roosters make. Low odor. It's common for urban areas that allow large animals, such as horses, to ban hogs, which are smaller than horses, but they create much more odor. And it would be nice if an animal kept in an urban environment as livestock 
provided more than one product, eggs and meat, for instance. So let's take a look at a list of potential urban livestock. This is by no means a definitive list. Um, notice that we've left off cows, um, we left off uh, hogs, we've left off horses. All of those in some areas may be uh, able to be kept in urban areas. But for the, our purposes, we're going to take a look mainly at smaller animals and uh, ones that fit more easily into an urban environment. And those would include chickens, but also in the same general category as chickens, you might also have uh, other fowls such as ducks. Um, rabbits, fish, goats, and honeybees. And we'll take a look at each one of these. Chickens, probably the most commonly kept livestock in urban areas are chickens. Um, they can provide eggs and meat. Um, in addition, feathers may also be a, be a saleable product. Um, particularly fancy varieties of chickens, their feathers are often used as decorations. Um, they're used for uh, fly tying for fishing and things like that. Um, they can also provide uh, down, which can be used in pillows and, and comforters and that sort of thing. Um, chickens also provide relatively large quantities of manure, which when composted makes an excellent fertilizer. <clears throat> and chickens also scratch at the soil. Um, chickens are omnivores. They eat anything, vegetable matter, animal matter, whatever. And um, they scratch at the soil in an attempt to turn up insects and weed and seeds and uh, worms and, and things like that. And uh, when confined in, a, uh, in an area, a number of chickens can almost totally remove weeds and other plants um, by this behavior and also be providing free fertilizer at the same time over the area. And many people take advantage of this behavior of chickens to create things called chicken tractors, which are enclosures that don't have bottoms and so allow the chickens to scratch at the soil and that can be moved from an area to a different area to prepare it for planting. This slide shows a uh, photograph of an A-frame chicken coop. This is a small coop, um, probably suitable for no more than uh, two chickens. And notice that it has no bottom so that the chickens can scratch in the ground, digging up weeds while they search for seeds and insects and worms. And you can tell uh, from looking at the picture that the area inside the enclosure already has uh, fairly large areas of bare earth exposed while the area outside the enclosure is still completely covered with green. Um, a portable enclosure like this um, provides uh, shelter in terms of the uh, enclosure on the end, also nest boxes uh, where the chickens will tend to lay their eggs, but at the same time keeping the chickens from escaping and protecting them from predators such as hawks and coyotes, um, coyotes becoming a, an ever greater presence in the urban environment. Rabbits. Rabbits have long been raised as food, and the fur is also a valuable product. Most rabbits weigh between 5 and 10 pounds when mature, but there are some breeds that can exceed 25 pounds. Rabbits are primarily herbivores, meaning they're plant eaters and can consume large amounts of plant material. They can be used to keep areas trimmed, though they won't typically clear plants down to the ground or to the soil, as uh, chickens will do. In addition, if kept in, a, in an enclosure without a bottom uh, on soil, they quickly dig under the enclosures and escape. Uh, enclosures for rabbits are typically referred to as hutches. 
This photograph shows a rabbit hutch. Um, this one's a uh, reasonably sized rabbit hutch and probably suitable for uh, three rabbits, maybe four. Fish. Fish is something that I think when people mention livestock, fish is not the first thing that pops into one's mind. But the idea of raising fish for food rather than catching them wild isn't a new idea. There are artificial fish ponds in the Czech Republic that date back to the mid-1600s and that are still in use today. Um, there are, in fact, um, indications that fish have been kept in artificial areas for uh, possibly thousands of years. And there are a number of ways to farm fish, to create the enclosures. One is in outdoor ponds. Um, a second is in cages that are then placed in natural bodies of water, lakes, rivers, or oceans. The cages keep the fish together, making them easy to harvest, but also protect them from predators, larger fish, and things like that that might come and uh, cut into your profits. Um, irrigation and drainage ditches are another area that fish are often kept, and it allows those to serve multiple purposes. You know, to provide water for irrigation, provide drainage for fields, and at the same time provide an environment for fish. Fish can also be kept indoors in various types of tanks. And many types of fish can be farm raised, but some are more suited than others due both to the types of food they require and the water temperatures they require. For instance, in warmer areas of the country, it's probably not practical to keep trout, as trout require cool water temperatures less than 70 degrees all the time. Um, however, in those areas, uh, things like uh, catfish and bass would be perfectly uh, happy with warmer water temperatures. This slide shows an urban fish farm, and notice that this one's inside. Fish farms have an ample supply of fish waste. Um, fish excrete quite a bit of waste. And that waste can be used as fertilizers for plants. So putting fish farms inside, inside a greenhouse in this case, allows the fish to grow year-round because the temperatures are warm. They achieve saleable size faster. And the water can be cycled into uh, irrigation water to irrigate plants, the plants then, uh, the soil and the plants then filter that water, which can be returned back to the fish enclosure. And so you have, you have created a closed loop system where the fertilizer uh, needed to grow the plants comes from fish waste and the clean water that the fish need comes from the process of the plants removing the fish waste. And goats. Goats are kept for a variety of purposes. Um, they're often kept as pets, but also kept because they give milk, um, they give meat, and they give fiber. There's also leather. Um, Goats are sometimes used to clear out overgrown areas as they eat a huge variety of plants, including stems and leaves from trees and shrubs, feeding more like deer than sheep. Sheep are grazers and tend to uh, eat grass and weeds and things on the ground level. Goats will uh, eat stems and leaves for as high up as they can reach. And uh, in certain areas where there's an area that's overgrown, um, it can be fenced in, a few goats released in there, and uh, in a matter of weeks, they'll often have uh, all the undergrowth cleared out. Um, goats can also be used to pull uh, carts and small wagons, things like that. This photograph shows a domestic goat. One thing to notice in this picture is this goat standing on a uh, 
sawn off tree stump. Goats love to climb and uh, they're also masters of escape so their enclosures need to be well maintained. Honeybees. Another thing that we probably don't think of immediately when someone mentions livestock. But honeybees are in fact livestock and they provide several products that are useful to humans. Of course they provide honey which is made from nectar of flowers with enzymes added by the bees and then the moisture removed. Humans have not been able to manufacture honey in labs. It's a secret only the bees have as of now. Bees also provide wax that we can use for candles, for sealing, for lubrication and preservation. Pollen, which is gathered by the bees as a source of protein, now they gather the nectar as a source of carbohydrates, which they drink, and liquid, water. Um, they also use the nectar to turn into honey, which they eat, uh, particularly through the winter time when they're holed up in their hives and don't have access to plants and flowers. But pollen is what bees use as a source of protein. Pollen is also eaten by humans and uh, sells for extremely high prices. And finally, uh, propolis is a substance that bees make from plant sap. And they use it to seal openings or cracks in their hives, um, glue things together. They coat hive interiors with it. Um, and they use it as a protection against disease. It's been shown that this propolis has um, antibacterial properties. And uh, if, for instance, uh, an animal like a mouse gets into a beehive, the bees will often, um, if they can't drive it out, they'll um, sting it and kill it inside the hive. A uh, decomposing mouse corpse inside a beehive is uh, a place that would be ripe for bacteria and fungi. And so the bees will coat it, coat the, uh, the dead mouse with propolis, and uh, the mouse is preserved, doesn't rot, doesn't spread disease, bacteria or fungi through the hives. Um, people consume propolis for supposed health benefits that it has. Um, but in addition to providing products useful to humans, bees provide an invaluable service, and that's pollination. And about one third of our food supply depends upon bees or other pollinators to pollinate. Without those animals, without bees, um, about the only plant products humans would be eating would be uh, grains, cereals, grasses, that sort of thing, because they depend on wind for pollination. Virtually all fruits, depend on bees. Virtually all vegetables depend on bees. So this is an invaluable service. Bees can increase crop yields dramatically. Um, in one study, um, farmers growing uh, watermelons in Florida uh, typically did not use bees as pollinators, didn't pay to have beekeepers bring beehives in to pollinate their their melon fields as their their yields were fairly high and um, you know they didn't feel that any increase would be worth it uh, worth the cost of having the beehives brought in and then in some experiments it was shown that uh, adding beehives around melon fields at the time that they're in flower could increase the yields by 70 percent most commercial watermelon growers now uh, pay the money to have beehives brought in. Other crops, such as the almonds in California, uh, are almost 100% dependent on bees being brought to the almonds to pollinate them for two weeks in February. And without, quite literally, millions of beehives being trucked to California for the almond pollination time, uh, we would have very, very few almonds. Um, honeybees can be any of several species, but 
in the U.S., almost all of them are so are the so-called European honeybee, um, Apis mellifera. Beehives, a single beehive or a group of beehives, is referred to as an apiary, the place where bees are kept. And you can see in this photograph several beehives in an enclosure on this suburban farm. Um, you can see the bees crowding around the entrances to the hives there. And if you look at this picture, you can see that these hives consist of uh, two boxes at the bottom. That's an area called the brood nest where young bees are raised. Above that, you see a uh, brown colored band all the way around. Um, that would be a thing called a queen excluder. The queen being larger than the worker bees cannot work her way up through the queen excluder, which is usually some type of uh, screen or an arrangement of uh, parallel bars. However, the worker bees can go up through that. Um, so as the bees come back with nectar, um, they crawl up through the queen excluder and put the nectar into cells where they make it into honey. But the queen excluder prevents the queen from getting up there and uh, laying eggs up in that part of the hive so that when those boxes up top are harvested, uh, they contain only honey. So how do you select urban livestock? Well, all the livestock that we've discussed here can be suitable for urban areas, but property selection is based on the site, the location that you have, um, the needs that you have for the, for the livestock, uh, consideration for the neighbors, and finally, regulations. Honeybees, for instance, are banned in many municipalities, although there is currently a trend to allow beekeeping in urban areas. Um, Chicago has recently legalized beekeeping within the city, for instance. Um, other cities, such as Madison, Wisconsin, have done the same. Um, in places where chickens are permitted, as we mentioned before, um, roosters are often banned due to noise issues. So keeping a self-sustaining population of chickens might not be possible in uh, urban areas as you need a rooster to fertilize the eggs to raise more baby chickens. Um, goats can sometimes be a little noisy. As I mentioned before, they're masters of escape. And many urban areas have ordinances against keeping them. Uh, however, many don't. It, it's, there, there's no way to say you need to check the local ordinances. Rabbits, though, are rarely banned as they're quiet, make virtually no noise, and generally without objectionable odor. Um, they also produce great quantities of manure, which, uh, again, can serve as fertilizer. And fish are also rarely banned. Um, unless the species uh, grown is deemed to be an ecological threat, such as the Asian carp. Some urban and suburban areas do allow large livestock, such as cows and horses. But most areas allowing large animals will have regulations regarding the minimum size of enclosures, usually stated in square feet per animal. And in fact, a lot of regulations even regarding chickens and goats and rabbits, have regulations um, stating the required area in square feet per animals. Uh, regulations also cover things like cleanliness and manure removal, as well as allowing inspections of the premises, most places that allow keeping urban livestock um, have a requirement that inspectors be allowed to come in virtually any time and inspect the premises for proper care of the animals and cleanliness. Finally, feeding large animals in an urban setting can be problematic as often virtually all of the food they're fed has to be purchased and transported to the site. So um, some storage area would be required, for instance, for hay for um, horses and cows, um, unless a, a, a large enough field is available that they can uh, graze solely on that. But then you have to make uh, allowances for wintertime when they can't be out there grazing and you're probably going to have to bring in foods. Um, 
One other thing about uh, the uh, minimum size of enclosures, the, in areas that have such regulations saying you need so many square feet per animal, um, regulations aren't consistent, again, from area to area for the same type of animal. And regulations vary substantially between types of animals. For instance, in one municipality um, that we examined, uh, where chickens were allowed, uh, people keeping chickens were required to have 16 square feet of essentially floor space, of, of open space per chicken. Okay, so a uh, chicken coop of uh, eight feet by six feet in that, uh, uh, in that municipality would be sufficient to legally keep three chickens. Um, the same municipality has a regulation on goats requiring 100 square feet per animal, so a minimum of a 10 by 10 enclosure uh, for a single goat. So check the regulations. They are not consistent. And complying with regulations, um, usually once you know what they are, the, the uh, complying part is fairly easy. Um, as I mentioned, there are things such as inspections that almost all municipalities allowing animals have, um, space required per animal, um, but there are also other regulations saying that enclosures have to be kept a certain distance from property lines and a certain distance from the residences on or residents on the property so that you might not be able to have a goat pin that shares a common wall with your house, for instance. It might have to be located 10 or 20 feet from the house, and it might have to be located 25 feet from a property line, that sort of thing. Um, also, uh, as an example, all states in the United States require beehives to be registered, regardless of where the beehives are, whether they're urban or rural, the beehives have to be registered this is usually a no-cost registration. Fill out a form, send it in. Um, at most, you know, it, it, it's less than $20, it seems. Um, but the purpose of it is to allow inspectors to know where all of the beehives in their state are located and to be able to make inspections of those beehives to prevent the spread of diseases such as American fowl brood, um, to help control insect uh, or uh, mites, that sort of thing. Um, so these inspections need to be performed, so all states require that. So regulations are um, vary, but all of them have seem like they have certain common sense things, such as allowing inspections. Um, here we'll talk about the other livestock output, um, waste. All types of livestock that we've talked about um, produce waste. Uh, and we need to look at how that waste is handled. The exception is honeybees, as they typically dispose of their own waste. Honeybees typically don't um, excrete waste inside their hives. They fly out and uh, excrete the waste outside the hive somewhere. And it's so small that it's usually not noticed. But all the other types of animals create a substantial amount of waste, and that waste has to be disposed of. However, animal manure makes excellent compost and fertilizer, um, particularly that from animals that are only fed vegetable matter, since that type of manure has very little odor, typically. Um, but if the site where you keep the animals is not also the site of plant production, where the waste can be composted and spread on the growing areas, then arrangements have to be made to dispose of waste in a, in a responsible manner. And uh, often um, that does not mean um, throwing it out with the uh, household garbage, but disposing of it in another manner. However, if the site is also the site of plant production, using the manure as compost and fertilizer on the same site is an ideal way of disposing of it. Uh, it can be composted, then it can be uh, spread 
on all of the growing areas as fertilizer and creating a closed loop system where the manure generated is used on site and much of the plant material grown on site ends up being food or bedding for the animals. Um, if that's not possible, then composting the manure on site and then selling it or even giving it away might be a viable alternative to um, having special waste haulers remove it. Um, neighbors with gardens, both flower gardens and vegetable gardens, are ready consumers of composted manure, though less so for raw manure that hasn't been composted. Um, and there also may be regulations regarding selling manure or compost made from manure, uh, so you have to check the local ordinances on that. Um, see the next unit um, on composting for more on how to use manure, the final um, output from keeping urban livestock. That concludes this unit.